Welcome to today's webinar on data review and publishing standards. Today we're going to look at how we review data and documentation, curate them and, pub and apply publishing standards to the data within the UKDS Discover catalogue. Discover comprises two elements, the main catalogue, which comprises large-scale social surveys and government data series, among other things, and the ReShare self-archiving repository, which contains data largely gathered from Research Council-funded researchers. We'll describe how we curate data curate data for both parts of the collection, and we'll start with the main collection and then move on to ReShare. You'll see that there are many similarities in the processes, but some slight differences too. So my name is Sharon Bolton and I work in the Ingest Services team here at the UK Data Archive. And we're going to talk about curating data and documentation for the main part of the collection now. Our collections development team receive data and collect documentation from depositors for the main part of the collection. When the acquisition process is complete and the license is assigned and all the data and documentation have been received, the package is passed to the Ingest Services team. The first thing that we do is run a quality assessment on the materials and this helps us uncover any issues with the data and documentation and means that we can deal with them early in the process and contact the depositor if there are any issues that we need to sort out. What we do within this quality assessment is look, we will look at the data, metadata and documentation. For example, we'll look at the integrity of the data. Do we find any errors in the data? Are there large amounts of missing data? And we will also look at the metadata within the data files as well, um, file variable and value label metadata. For example, is it accurate and complete? Does it describe the variables, variables properly? We then look at the documentation and check that we have everything we need so that users can make informed use and analysis of the data. We will ensure that the documentation covers methodology, the questionnaire, if, if a survey has been conducted, that any derived variables within the files are documented and the weighting methods are described, including how to use the weighting variable. If we find that the documentation, we need extra pieces of documentation to cover all this information, we can then contact the depositor and ask for them to be sent. We all, at this stage, we also set a publishing standard for the data and that depends on, the likely, on its likely use. If we're going to put it into our Nest, our online data browsing tool, we need to apply a high level of data enhancement to the data, obviously depending on the condition that it's arrived in. For example, we combine the data variables with the question text side by side where they can be seen on screen. So we will look at all the materials and check that we're happy with the quality and that we are able to proceed to curation. We also undertake a data anonymization disclosure review where we will check the data for any likely confidentiality issues. And the kind of things we will look at, obviously depending on the contents of the individual data file, will be direct identifiers, have they been left in the data? Um, for example, does the data contain names, addresses, telephone numbers, or anything else that can directly identify respondents, such as email addresses or images? And we will ensure that unless explicit consent has been given to share these images with, with to share these images or other characteristics with other researchers, we will ensure that any direct identifiers have been removed from the data. We will also look at indirect identifiers, and these tend to be demographics and key variables. For example, age, ethnicity, education and employment, religion, household size, detailed income or geography. Indirect identifiers may not directly reveal the identity of people in the, in the data file, but we, what we need to check is whether combinations could reveal their identity. For example, are their cases unique within the sample? 
we need to balance confidentiality protection of respondents without without taking without removing or anonymizing so much so much in the data that we restrict its research usability in some cases uh, anonymization may be very simple to achieve but in other cases it may be far more complex if it can't be achieved without compromising the research utility of the data we will consider more restrictive access conditions and here at the UK Data Service we have a range of those for example the depositor may give, may give permission to each respondent who applies for the data so they therefore have an idea of who is using their data and for what purpose. We may enter the data into our secure access system with the depositor's agreement as well. Um, if, and that way we can preserve the usability of the, da of the data without over-anonymizing over it. We discuss all these solutions with the data creator, and that's not just for confidentiality reasons. We will look at data edits, um, recoding, banding, aggregation, etc. for anonymization, or we will agree the kind of access restriction they may want. Um, what we try and do is open a dialogue with the depositor as soon as possible and we make sure that we liaise with them and build up a good relationship so that we can ensure we work together with them to provide a very good data set for the secondary user. At present, with regard to confidentiality and disclosure, we're developing the use of software tools to automate some elements of disclosure review, especially where the in looking at indirect identifiers are concerned. All the softwares we're currently using at are open source, and they're all based on algorithms which check the indirect identifiers and key variables against each other. It's early days yet, but we've found some quite encouraging results so far. When the, all, when the quality assessment and the disclosure review is complete, we then move on to the main stage of data curation and processing. We will look at whether we need to make any enhancements with the data, and as, as I mentioned, we do this in consultation with the depositor. We will look at data integrity. We may find errors which we need to rectify or note if no solution is available. Um, we might look at out-of-range codes, missing values, etc. And if we don't have enough metadata or information on what those particular elements mean, we will go back to the depositor, get the information that we need, and we will add it to the data. We also create additional metadata from data files. Um, we might add metadata directly or improve it, but we also generate a data dictionary or code book for each of the files that we use. When processing is finished on the data files, we will then generate multiple data formats for, which cover both dissemination and preservation. Data dissemination formats, for example, include pro producing other software-specific formats. For example, data which is deposited with us in SPSS. We will always make a Stata version as well for those users who prefer Stata. Um, we will generate, for preservation, we will generate an ASCII fix, fixed width version of each of the files. This may not be very user-friendly, but it's very good for long-term preservation. We will <coughs> archive the metadata alongside it, so that and the aim of doing this is that no, so that no matter how the software changes in the future, you'll be able to lo load it into whichever package um, you use for statistical analysis and match match the data and document and metadata. Okay, if I move on to documentation processing now. Um, documentation processing is very similar for most types of study across all the access levels and we'll see some very similar processes for the reshare documentation processing as well. What we do for the main collection is that we convert most software specific documentation to the PDFA format, which is Adobe PDF. and PDFA is their archival standard. Um, this usually applies when we receive data in Microsoft Word or RTF formats. Um, 
The aim of transferring it to PDF is so that it's available for users in, um, in an easy to use, well supported format. But, it be, but with the PDFA standard, it's also more suitable for long term preservation. If we receive um, elements like variable catalogues or code books or data dictionaries in Excel, we will, we will usually preserve that in Excel for dissemination purposes so that users can find that quite easy to use. But we also create an archival format for long-term preservation. For example, that's usually a tab delimited text version of each of the worksheets, worksheets in the Excel file. For PDF files, we add bookmarks and headers for easy navigation and to make sure that it's easy to tell that that piece of documentation goes with a particular study. We may sometimes create additional data documentation as well. For example, the data dictionaries I mentioned, or we might create glossaries, um, guides, data lists, and that sort of thing as well. For every study that we curate, we also create a README file, and this contains just elements about what we've done to the study while it's being processed, and also anything which might be useful for users but isn't necessarily covered in the documentation. Um, it also, if any docu data or documentation problems remain in situ after we've processed the data, this is a place where we can advise users so that they're aware of any issues. Sometimes we receive hard copy documentation. This is quite rare now because most of the files that we receive are in electronic format. But if we do receive paper documentation, for example, if we're archiving quite an old classic sociology study, we can convert, scan and convert this to electronic form and apply optical character recognition as well. So it's much more searchable and usable. Once the data and documentation are, create, uh, are processed and preserved on our preservation server and, made a, and collated into a format which is easy for users to download and use, we create a catalogue record for each study in the collection. And to do this, we try, the aim of the catalogue record is to try and ensure that users are able to read the catalogue record and make a decision on whether it's the, um, it's the study that they want to use for their research. And we will compile the catalogue record using information about the study which has been provided by the depositor. Um, we might augment that with study reports or links to project websites too. Technically, we create a study level, level metadata catalogue record in DDI format and DDI's data documentation initiative um, that goes into the Discover catalogue. The DDI format is a recognised metadata schema and it helps to ensure that records from our catalogue may be transferable across the web into other catalogues as well, which helps people discover our data. As well as the catalogue record itself, we also create a keyword index and we use, for this we use a standard thesaurus um, which contains keywords which we can use to describe the same concepts across a range of studies. And this ensures standardised searching across Discover so that if, you, if you're, say, looking for data on employment, you will retrieve a list of all the, all the studies in our catalogue which have had that index term applied to them. So it, that apply, means that results are standardised and it helps you find the data that you need. Our catalogue page also includes citation, which is intended for users to be to have easy copy and paste facilities so they can put it into their publications once they've used the data. And this has a digital object identifier, or DOI, which enables the referencing of data in publications. It helps the provenance of the data become much more visible. And if you put the DOI link into any browser, it will take you to information about that study. Here you can see an example for a recent quarterly labour force survey, which credits all the parties which are are responsible for creating the data. 
the Office for National Statistics and the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. Um, it names the data set by title and it lets you know that this is a data collection. For example, it's not a book or a journal article. It gives you the UK Data Services distributor and the study number and finally gives you a link to the digital object identifier. Okay. Well, in a nutshell, that's what we do to curate data and documentation for the main catalogue. I'm now going to hand you over to my colleague, Vera, who will talk to you about the self-archiving processes and the share. So Sharon so, described indeed what we would consider to be our gold standard for assessing, reviewing and publishing data collections that we receive from depositors who deposit their data sets with us. Over the last few years, we've also had a smaller repository where researchers can self-archive their own data collections, and we mainly use that to receive data sets that result from um, research projects funded by the research councils in the UK. So here we've implemented uh, procedures that mimic our gold standard, but whereby we expect researchers to do most of that data preparation, data processing, data curation work themselves before they upload the data onto the repository, and we then do, do the quality control and the review. So I'll show you how we have implemented that in practice. <coughs> This, sorry, I covered this. Uh, one main, um, one first form of assessment is to check whether the data collections that we receive fit within our data collections development policy that researchers can consult, which basically is data sets that are of use to the wider social science community. In the deposit process, you can here see the division of the responsibilities where researchers are creating a metadata record for their data collection, are uploading the data and documentation files after they have prepared them, select the suitable access and license conditions and submit that to us. We then carry out the review and the publishing. We have made this deposit process as easy and straightforward as possible. For example, we managed to harvest a lot of metadata from existing systems, so we reduce the amount of metadata that researchers have to type in and provide themselves. How can we then ensure that when we rely on researchers to do this themselves, that we do get high quality data sets? First of all, we give quite prescriptive guidance to depositors on how they can prepare their data files and their documentation files, and that is available directly in the system. I'll show you that soon. So guidelines on how to anonymize data, what are our recommended file formats, how they should prepare their documentation, etc. Then we provide step-to-step -step guidance on how to upload and deposit their data and the documentation. This is also available in the video that um, researchers can consult before starting the process. On the home page we also showcase exemplar data sets that we have received whereby we say these are really good data collections, well prepared, well documented, these researchers have really put in a, a good amount of, of effort so we showcase them on the on the home page of ReShare. And then we review each of the data sets before we publish it whereby we check them for disclosure risk copyright breaches, the validity of the file formats, and the level of the documentation. So I'll show you on the ReShare page, which you should see now. We have the example data collections on the home page itself, which are real collections that are in the ReShare repository that people can go and consult. We have links, the help information links people to the guidance and we'll look at that in detail, which is quite prescriptive, do this, do that, prepare this, etc. And finally, the review procedures that we follow are also online in 
the reshare repository. So it specifically says what we do before we publish a data set in terms of quality control. So this is, for example, the prescriptive guidance on anonymization. This is where researchers prepare their data before they would upload it into the repository. So it's prescriptive to, to make it easier for researchers to follow. Remove names, remove addresses, change the date of birth to a year, remove information that's in the file properties, etc. So these are all instructions that people can follow check hidden track changes in text files. It's important noting that a lot of the data collections that we receive in the reshare repository are often qualitative data collections. So transcripts of interviews, recordings of interviews, transcripts of folk scripts, discussions, etc. We also have a text anonymization tool that can help depositors to check for disclosive information that might be in textual transcripts. We provide equally prescriptive guidance for the documentation to prepare. So we have a list of what we expect researchers to upload. A readme file, that comes again with instructions. What do we understand to be a readme file? What should be in the readme file? It should describe each of the files that is uploaded, what is in the files and how they might be related. So if you have a collection of 20 interviews, then provide us a list with those 20 interviews and indicate what is in each of the interview files. If in addition to that you have various documentation files, list the names of the documentation files and tell us what it is. It might be the consent form, it might be interview instructions, it might be the questionnaire list, etc. That single readme file then gives an easy overview to the user of what is in the data set. We want clear variable descriptions and code labels in data files. If we're talking about quantitative data, we want a questionnaire form or a data dictionary if the data set results from surveys. If it results from interviews, we want to see topics and question lists. We want to have a data list for textual data collections. And again, the website guidance describes what is a data list, how should I make one, where can I see good examples in the collection of how other researchers have done it. We want to see a copy of the consent form and the information sheet, a description of methods, etc. When we then receive the data set after the research has submitted it, we equally have very detailed review steps that we follow. We first of all do some reviews at the level of the entire data set, so at the level of the data collection. We check that the metadata that's been provided is clear and is in sufficient detail and indeed describes the data set that has been uploaded. We check the metadata and the consent forms for any legal or ethical information that might have an influence on whether or not we can make those data available for reuse by other researchers. If it's a qualitative data collection, we check the consent agreements that have been uploaded to make sure that data sharing is indeed allowed. We check copyright states and permissions that might apply, for example, where data sets uh, result from secondary analysis of existing data or combinations of existing data files. And if the data result from a research project funded by the research councils, the UK research councils, then by providing a grant number, researchers have the ability to link directly to a project record on the Gateway to Research that provides a lot of um, publications and other outputs from their project. So we also check that that link has indeed automatically been included in the metadata record. At the level of the files that have been uploaded, we check that they open. We check that the formats uh, have are conformed to our recommended file formats, which again, the file format recommendations is available in the help guidance uh, via an easy link, uh, linking to our table of information that's available online. So all of this information is in the guidance. We check that file properties have no names of people or other disclosive information in it, and we check that the access and licensing that the researcher has selected is indeed the most suitable for whatever confidentiality concerns we might have. And we check that documentation files have been set to open access.
In more detail then, we have further reviewing steps for quantitative data. We go and check that all the disclosure variables have been removed from the data file. Typically these are names, dates of birth, addresses, place names, geography, etc. We check if there is string variables, textual variables in a data file, that there's nothing that is disclosed information in those textual variables. We check that there's no hidden track changes in files and that quantity files come with variable descriptions, labels, codes and values. If we find that any of this is not in order, then we simply return the data collection back to the depositor with um, highlighting our concerns or our findings and asking them to uh, make changes before uploading it again. In the case of qualitative data, as already said, we receive a lot of uh, collections of interviews that can often be quite extensive. There we check 10%, a 10 percent sample at least of uh, data items, as these can be quite extensive data collections. We check that there's no disclosive information in textual files or in recordings, if it's recordings that have been uploaded. We check again for track changes that might remain in transcripts and if there's any blacked out or redacted information that it is not reversible. At times researchers might just use black highlighting to hide information which of course is easily converted back or removed by a user. And finally we have a look at the documentation to make sure that what we asked people to upload has indeed been uploaded, that we indeed have the essential documentation that we wanted uh, and possibly any further desired documentation that we want. The main aim here is to have sufficient documentation so that users can understand the data, but from our experience we know that there are certain essential documents that we absolutely need to have for that, such as a questionnaire form or a data dictionary topics question list for interviews, uh, information on the consent form, the information sheet that was given to participants, etc. Again, if any of this is missing, we contact the depositor, ask them to upload it. And finally, related resources can be uploaded. We check that those links are indeed working um, and that there's no copyright issues, for example, in case um, of publication if it been uploaded and if publications are available via the Gateway to Research then only that link should be included because that's sort of a, a standard, um, a good standard for that kind of information. This sort of describes the procedures that we follow and that we have um, implemented over the last few years so thank you very much for your attention.